So what I want to talk about today is uh, this area of research for statistical computing called ABC, on which I've been working for about 10 years now with uh, colleagues in Montpellier, both from the stat and the biology department. So actually, to just tell a short story of how I came to ABC, uh, I was contacted by biologists to, to join uh, a grant proposal on this technique. And the first time they exposed the method to me, I said it was uh, complete rubbish. And then it's only a, f a few hours later that starting to, to sift through and I saw the, the point in, in the approach. So um, this is uh, the outline of, of what I want to talk about, hopefully getting to, to the last point that is maybe more related to machine learning than, than the, other, uh, the other topics. Um, I start with this, this first uh, uh, section on, on econometrics because actually um, there are links with the econometrics uh, literature of the 90s that came visible, or even 80s, that came visible only uh, late in the evolution of, of ABC. And even though econometrics is a bit uh, far from, from the biology domain, uh, the methods were, were quite similar. So I'll start with a, a few words on, on this method, if only to, to link the method with uh, its uh, historical uh, background. And so one, one uh, major reference in, uh, in this uh, computational econometrics that relates to his ABC is uh, this book by uh, my colleagues at Crest, uh, Christian Gorriero and Alain Montfort on uh, simulation-based econometrics. And from, from the, the 80s, uh, econometrics had been trying to explore new models and more complex models uh, that were not manageable in a classical way through simulation techniques. And here is a list of, of uh, some of those methods. They all sound the same, but the idea is, is indeed uh, similar to what I will uh, explain ABC is. Namely that when we have a complex model uh, where the likelihood is either partially known or partially untractable, uh, simulation of pseudo-data in comparison with the actual data, as for instance in the simulated method of moments, may replace uh, the inference based on, on the actual uh, uh, likelihood. Okay. And there are, once you, you start with this idea, there are many ways of implementing it with different validations. Uh, and different costs in terms of, of precision of the estimators, but, but the idea is, is, is roughly the same. And one method that really uh, comes uh, really tangential to the ABC uh, domain is this method of indirect inference that was developed by Gurejo et al. in 93, in where the true model being unavailable to draw directly inference, this Indirect inference was to start with a pseudo model where estimators in this pseudo model were used to derive a distance uh, between the, the true parameter for the observations and parameters for pseudo observations. So, I mean, this is very uh, vague as an explanation, but uh, as we will see in the introduction of ABC, this is very uh, connected with, with this idea. And uh, so, for instance, I mean, pseudo uh, score or pseudo maximum likelihood are uh, ways of constructing estimators, again, based on a fake model uh, that may have similar moments to the uh, actual models, but they are, this model is just there to create uh, an estimator beta hat out of which a distance is constructed between the one based on uh, the observation and, and one based on pseudo observations. And then the validation, uh, well, depends on the model, the true model, the choice of the models, the number of parameters, and so on. And so it's not, again, very precise, but uh, in the book, for instance, there are, there are sufficient conditions for 
this type of estimation to be consistent. And I'm talking of point estimation and the approximation to maximum lactin estimators. There is no Bayesian IDs in, in, in direct inference, at least at this time. Uh, but, but this is a type of, of uh, validation you can find. So let me skip this example. Uh, there is a, a related paper by people that are more within the MCMC community, uh, Arnoldo Frigesi and his colleague uh, Hegland, where they studied in Jersey's B uh, indirect inference from a, a more statistical vision and tried to infer about which type of pseudomodal one had to use with this type of vague conclusion on, on the choice of the model so that beta hat had to be connected with a true parameter but uh, not of a dispersed to, to keep some information on where the true parameter is. Uh, and then ABC made the link with indirect inference. So I ex explained this before explaining what ABC is, but uh, in, in two papers, one by Chris Durandi and, and, and colleagues, where uh, it was only used to, to create summary statistics. And another one that is uh, a major paper in the ABC literature by Paul Fanhead and Dennis Prangle, where they compared standard indirect inference with uh, their proposal for ABC uh, implementation. And I'll come back to that uh, later. OK, so this is one historical link that, that is a big tweak because it was not made until late in, in the evolution of ABC. Uh, the, the more natural uh, construction uh, of the history of ABC is through genetics. And so I'll just try to explain briefly uh, what I understand of, of this uh, history by uh, explaining the, the model that led to, to the necessity of, of, of building this ABC procedure. Because it started, and the name and the method started in the late 90s uh, with people like, like Griffiths, Balding, uh, Tavare, and Beaumont, uh, who had, were facing uh, incredible difficulties to handle well-constructed models, but with complex uh, likelihoods. And standard computational methods were not at the scale that, that could handle such models. So let me try to tell you uh, very quickly, borrowing from someone else's uh, slides, uh, what, what, why there is a problem in this uh, statistical analysis of some population genetics model. So the, the starting point is, is this evolution of individuals uh, through generations. So this is called the, the right Fisher uh, model. And uh, in, individuals evolve from parents, and some uh, families die, and other families uh, grow. And so after a while, uh, well, all the individuals on this picture uh, come from uh, the, same, uh, the same parent. Okay. And so this leads at the observation level, so instead of looking at the population, we look at a sample of individuals from this population. That's what's called the, the coalescent uh, theory, where one uh, sample here of three individuals uh, stem from uh, a common parent, that is called the most recent common ancestor, by branching at some time in the past, and those times, like tau one and tau two, uh, and tau three are unknown. And so there is a distinction between the population and the observed sample in that, of course, the times are not the same, but we are never observing the whole, observa the whole population. And so what matters is a, is a sample uh, description. And so the, mo the probability model that will try to fit the data in this situation is uh, the Kingsman uh, neutral mutation model, where again, from uh, a, an ancestor that is as close as possible, so the most recent common ancestor, uh, individuals will, will have evolved with a uh, mutation on the way to their current uh, uh, status. And so, for instance, in this uh, small graph, from the recent common, uh, most recent common ancestor, at some point in the branching, uh, uh, a gene G became a gene T, 
or, or an, uh, a phenotype G became a phenotype T. And to describe it just a bit, a bit more, uh, it's, it's, it's a fairly simple model if you look at it from the past. So if you start from the most recent common ancestor at random times, uh, the, the three branches, and those times are uh, driven by an exponential distribution uh, that depends on the number of, of branches at the end. And then along those branches at random times again, uh, there are mutations in, uh, in, in the characteristic of, of the population to end up at the current time with uh, those, for instance, eight observations with those different uh, characteristics. Okay. And so if you, I mean, that's a fairly straightforward uh, model. And even, even if you have uh, hundreds of individuals to, to, to see how it, it, it moves from the most recent common ancestor is uh, fairly simple. And of course, you can make things more complicated by introducing more parameters that drive the mutations uh, differently at different times. You may have uh, uh, an evolution pressure that, that goes away from neutral. You could have admixtures where two populations will, or two groups of individuals will uh, merge again at a more recent time, and so on and so forth. But essentially, that's, that's a model that is still easy to describe with a few number of, of, of uh, parameters. And so that's not... A, a big data problem in, in, uh, in the common sense. However, uh, why is it difficult to handle uh, such model? It's because uh, we are not looking at it from the most recent common ancestor, but from today's perspective. And so this tree is considered from the sample at time uh, zero, I mean today, and the different parameters in the tree have to be reconstructed from this sample and only from this sample. And so going back uh, to the parameters mean integrating out all the possible stories from this most recent common ancestor with the t not only the times, but also the structure of the tree uh, possibly unknown, I mean, the length of the branches and, and things like that. And so the integrating out this missing data structure, even though the complete model is nice and, and quite manageable, is, is a hard task that led to the, the production of this ABC uh, methodology. Because again, I mean, the topology is, is not directly the problem, so we have something that is given of that form, but uh, what happened along the branch is all the possible mutations are unknown, the times are unknown, and to, to run in, uh, important sampling in, in such a model, uh, that was a proposal by uh, 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 Peter Donnelly and Matthew Stevens in the early uh, 2000s just uh, runs into a wall very quickly. I mean, with a, one additional parameter, uh, it collapses or it requires uh, weeks and weeks uh, of computation. And so, the, the, I mean, population geneticists didn't have the time for uh, this, 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 uh, this, times of, this type of, 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 uh, of computation cost. Now, just one uh, ex example that uh, may sound funny, but it's, 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 it's one that where we were indirectly involved, uh, is to try to trace the ancestry of uh, the um, Asian ladybird beetle that uh, came from somewhere in Asia and um, is pretty uh, present in, uh, in, in Europe. Now, especially in, for instance, Paris, Paris uh, South University uh, is totally invaded by, by those beetles. And, and in, this, in the winter, they, they just coalesce in big, big, big lumps and, and make a, a big mess in, in the room. So this is a, a real problem. And the question was to try to find how they came, through which route uh, they came uh, to Europe. Uh, for one reason that, I mean, first to understand how they came, but also to try to find ways to fight them uh, by creating biocontrols. Okay. And so this was uh, the result of an analysis based on this ABC algorithm to try to find the most plausible route from uh, a certain area uh, all the way to Europe, uh, mostly through uh, America, uh, rather than directly uh, through this route. And to link with the previous uh, explanation, uh, this is exactly the central problem 
that we find in most ABC applications in population genetics, namely that we have uh, this evolution tree from the most uh, recent common ancestor uh, with different uh, populations that are observed through a few samples. And this is one of the possible scenarios. And the question is, what is the possible probability of this particular uh, uh, probable uh, scenario? And this was the most probable in, in this analysis that told us that uh, population three, that is the European uh, in, in invasive uh, species, uh, mostly merged from one species in China and another one in Kazakhstan. And you can see two times that are indicated in, in uh, with, with figures, uh, six, seven, and, and 50. Those were the time where those two, uh, population five and population four uh, species, were created by uh, in the US and then in, in France a bit later. And so the population that we see today is not coming from those biocontrol, and it may explain why uh, they, they, they are so invasive and why a new control is necessary. So it, it has impacts even uh, in the end in creating ways to fight uh, this pest. Okay, so I keep talking about ABC um, without defining it, so uh, we'll eventually come to it. Uh, again, the, the starting, uh, starting point is having uh, a likelihood that is untractable for many uh, possible reasons. So I gave an example here of uh, a marginal uh, likelihood that comes through uh, integrating out a, a missing variable or an auxiliary variable Z. In the best situations, uh, you can run MCMC on f of y z and, and derive uh, simulation uh, from, from y, or if you are interested in possible probability on, on, on theta, well, by completing theta and theta and z, you, you, could, you could get uh, indirect uh, inference on theta uh, this way. However, if the dimension of z or the structure of z is too complex, uh, this is not uh, possible. And there are other cases where the likelihood function contains uh, a term that is intractable. Uh, often you can re rephrase it as a missing uh, variable uh, problem, but for instance, if you think of, uh, of uh, Markov random fields, there is a normalizing constant that is that is uh, not well approximated and, and, and that is not computable in, in most situations. And so and there are uh, cases where MCMC cannot be uh, implemented, even uh, with, with a lot of imagination and, and uh, perseverance, uh, MCMC may fail. And the same thing applies to important sampling, uh, which is why this, this uh, very clever proposal of Donnelly and Stevens uh, didn't uh, go very far in the, in, in the community because it couldn't handle uh, complex models. Okay. So because you can go exactly Bayes, we have to go through uh, an almost Bayes uh, solution. But uh, again, the almost will, will kind of vanish uh, for some reasons I will explain later. Uh, so, I mean, just to give you a rather silly toy examples, but uh, if you think of, of a stochastic volatility model, and I know there are ways to handle it differently through particle filters, but if you take it as a, as a given time series without a, any uh, uh, sequential feature, you have to integrate out uh, a very long series to uh, produce the likelihood of your observed series. Because a ZT, that is, for instance, an AL1 process, uh, is all the same dimension of than the, the YTs. And so if T is very large, uh, recreating uh, an approximation to, to the likelihood that, that, is, uh, that, that is close enough uh, is, is is quite difficult. So this is an, a silly example in that I, I run an, an important uh, sampler to show what is the range of the proposed values for z compared with the, with the true one. I mean, you don't have to, to read the details. You can't. But uh, I mean, it's not very relevant. And so the other example I just mentioned is the one of, for instance, of Pat's model. If you have a single parameter theta on a large, on a large uh, grid uh, for the observations, uh, you are missing in the likelihood the normalizing constant. And of course, if you want to run uh, Bayesian analysis on this model, um, you are getting into trouble because a constant uh, is missing. 
Again, this is a bit of a toy problem because there are uh, solutions. And then the, the, uh, the one that started us on that is a phylogenetic tree uh, example, more through uh, phylogenies than, than the tree itself. All right, so at last to, the, to, to what is the ABC algorithm. Well, it starts in this, paper, in this founding paper by uh, Simon Tavare by this uh, fairly simple remark that if I can produce a simulation from a prior and a pseudo data conditional on that simulation of the parameter, if I keep doing that until my pseudo observation is exactly uh, my observation, so if z is equal to y, then the theta prime that get out of this loop is distributed from the posterior. Okay? Uh, that's very simple. It's because the property of acceptance in this accept reject algorithm is f of y given theta. So the, prior, the distribution of the theta is pi of theta multiplied by the property of acceptance f of y given theta, and therefore it's proportional to uh, the posterior. Okay. So that's, uh, that's straightforward. But that makes uh, a tool in that if simulating from this likelihood is much simpler than computing the likelihood, which in my uh, population genetic example means that if producing a tree is much simpler than integrating out all the possible trees, that creates a, a possible entry to, to solve uh, the problem of the intractable uh, likelihood. Okay. And this remark is, is this back further uh, in time than to this paper by Chavare. Uh, there, there are two links in, in 1984. One is by Don Rubin in a, in a paper in the Annals of Statistics where he was try, just trying to make sense of what a Bayesian analysis is by proposing his explanation for the posterior. So it was not uh, algorithmic at all. It was more uh, a working example on, on what Bayesian analysis does. And then there's another ex uh, example uh, by uh, Peter Diggle and, and a co-author uh, in, in the same year, in, in Jurassic uh, B, I believe. Now, of course, this is a, a, a property that is uh, very simple, but also uh, too simple in that if you have a complex model, and this is normally what we want to handle with ABC methods, you cannot wait for pseudo data to be equal to your uh, observed data, to the true data. Okay, so this event of z equal to y is either of probability zero or of such a small probability that is, is, you cannot wait for this event. And so the A in ABC starts with uh, an approximation of this uh, acceptance. Uh, equality, uh, namely the fact that z and y are close enough up to a tolerance level uh, epsilon. Okay. So you're generating, the way to implement the algorithm is that generating uh, pseudo data associated with, with parameters from the prior and keeping only the parameters for which the pseudo data is reasonably close to the observed uh, data. Okay. So that creates an approximation, but you don't have to wait uh, an infinite amount of time for this to happen. And so the distribution produced by an ABC simulation is simply uh, a distribution where the data is replaced by a rough version. So instead of, of conditioning on Y, you condition on Y plus or minus epsilon in that sense that uh, you, you could have observed a Z uh, that is at a distance of at most epsilon to Y. So you degrade the quality of the data uh, and then produce an exact posterior with this degraded uh, data. And the implementation is, is, is straightforward once you, you accept this principle uh, of, of degrading the quality of the data. It's, it's, it means creating a, a huge table of parameters from the prior and then pseudo data associated with those parameters, and cutting out of this huge table a subset for which the pseudo data is close enough to the observed data. Okay. 
Now, in this slide, there's uh, an additional uh, uh, term, which is this eta. And that's where it, it starts getting a bit uh, uh, complicated, namely uh, waiting for the data and the pseudo data to be close enough uh, may not be realistic if you have large uh, data sets. And for instance, in genetics, you have a large number of bases, or so in time series, you may have a very long time series. And to wait for two time series to be close enough uh, doesn't make sense. Or you have to wait too long to, to be uh, realistic. And so when ABC is implemented, usually there is an, another step in degrading the data, namely that the data itself is replaced by this eta of y, where eta is a function of the data that we call summary statistics, where well, it's a statistic. And we only look at the difference between a summary statistic for the data and a summary statistic for the pseudo data. And if those two summary statistics are close enough, uh, then we accept the value of the parameter. Okay, so that's a, another layer of approximation and another layer of information loss because most of the time, given that we are not in exponential families, uh, you cannot find a small dimensional summary statistic eta, and therefore eta is not sufficient, and there is an, another level of, of, of loss. Okay. So the outcome of, uh, of the output of the, of the algorithm is a certain posterior distribution that goes with, with this conditional that eta of v and eta of y are close enough at the level epsilon. And the validation uh, started with this notion that given my early uh, introduction of ABC, if epsilon is almost zero, we do simulate from the posterior. So if I can push the epsilon down to almost zero, I should get an outcome that is uh, reasonably similar to something from the posterior. Okay, so that's the idea. Uh, and you can prove that, I mean, mathematically it's easy to prove that if you push epsilon to zero, uh, one way or another, uh, you do get uh, the, the posterior. Okay. And you just have to assume some continuity and, and measurability of, of different things, but that's easy to, to, to prove. Now, of course, uh, this is not true if eta is not sufficient. So the best we can hope for is that when epsilon is small enough, we get a good approximation to pi of theta given eta of y. Okay. And so that's, again, why I will insist for most uh, of the talk on this choice of, of the summary statistic eta, because what what's really drives the quality of ABC more than anything else is a choice of this eta. And, and there is no uh, single solution uh, adopted so far by the, the ABC community. So just to give you an example, uh, on, on the uh, silly toy example, the the benchmark Pima Indian woman uh, diabetes uh, study that you can uh, borrow from R. Picking three explanatory variables, x1, x2, x3, uh, we run a, a, a probit uh, modeling of the presence of, of diabetes and compared uh, a regular MCMC outcome with one based on ABC. Um, with a distance, because it's an so example, a distance based on the difference between the MLEs for the observed data and for simulated data. So again, you cannot do that in a realistic situation, but uh, this is a toy example. Okay, and this is uh, the, the result of uh, the analysis for the three parameters, beta 1, beta 2, and beta 3, comparing the, the truth produced by MCMC and the ABC approximation. And in this toy example, of course, uh, everything works uh, nicely. Otherwise, I would not uh, show it to you. <laughs> now, so it's, it's a toy example. So, and, and end of the story. Now, let's move to something that is both toyish and, and much more interesting, 
which is the MA example. Again, because if you take time series, um, there are a few parameters, but there is a lot of noise too. So you may have a very long uh, time series and, and still have trouble extracting uh, the, the information about the parameter or separating the noise uh, from the information. So let's take this, this, this MEQ model where the noise is correlated with, with earlier noises down to uh, horizon Q. Let's put a prior on uh, the parameters uh, theta i, that is a prior on uh, the identifiable uh, region of the parameter space, which is a triangle in dimension two and some weird structure in larger dimensions. And let's run ABC. So if, you, if we take the AMA2, we have two parameters, theta1, theta2. From the prior distribution, they are uniformly distributed over, over a triangle. And so to create an ABC sample, we simulate the pair theta1, theta2 in the triangle. With this pair, we create an uh, a new MA2 realization through the production of this IID sequence of epsilon t's. So that's two lines uh, of code. And then we have to make the choice of the distance. So I mean, this example is just to point out the importance of the distance and of the summary statistics. The first idea is to get uh, plain, uh, to a plain application of, of, the, of the ABC method by looking at the distance between the simulated series and the observed series. So we have the xt's and the x prime t's, and we look at how, how different they are. Of course, if we take 5,000 of, of those observations, you have a series, the series will, will diverge very quickly, and so the distance uh, will, will have always about the same behavior, whether the parameters are, are similar or not. So there is not much information in computing this distance, and we'll see the outcome uh, in a minute. The alternative is to go directly for a summary of, of the data into an insufficient statistic made of, of those sorts of correlations. You could divide by t if you, if you wish, and look at the distance between the tau j. So for instance, if you are in an MA2 model, you could take the, the first two autocorrelations, or the first 10. I mean, there is, again, no uh, reason to pick any particular uh, group of summary statistics, but we have to reduce the dimension to something small so that we can compare comparable things. Okay. And this is uh, the uh, outcome of those two experiments. Uh, the, the one on, uh, uh, on the left, uh, and someone's left, is uh, the one with uh, using only the summary statistics, and the one on the right is uh, the one using uh, the, the distance between the row data. And so there are codes for the colors. Uh, the, the gray or, or beige zone is simulation from the priors. The blue one is for a distance that is 10% of all of the simulated distances. The red is for 1%, and uh, the, the, the yellow is for 0.1%. And so what this says is that there is a concentration as epsilon decreases, but the speed of the concentration depends very much on the choice of the distance. And so if I take 10% of all the distances in uh, the right part, I'm very close to simulating from the prior. In the leftmost uh, part, I'm already very far from the prior. And so the concentration is, is much faster uh, using Though this summary statistic of dimension two compared with using the whole data. Again, it's a toy problem. It just could, uh, I mean, everyone could, could think of that uh, directly. And the impact on the Poisson distribution of the, on the two parameters is uh, uh, equally uh, visible. Here I run an MCMC to, to compare with. So the, bar, the dark uh, curve is the result of, of an MCMC experiment. And you can see that as you decrease epsilon, uh, there is no fast concentration to something that, that is close to the, to the true outcome. So there, there is definitely a loss. And we could think that even if epsilon was, was very, very, very close to zero, we would still see this loss. If instead I pick uh, 
only the summary statistics, I get uh, a better concentration that is not identical to the, to the true posterior, but that stays in, in roughly the same regions with a bit more variability. Okay. So that's uh, one, one uh, example that tells us that choosing the summary statistic and reducing the dimension uh, from the start is, is, is quite important. And actually, t t this morning I was, I was looking on archive, and uh, there was a, pa a paper on ABC. There is one almost every day, but uh, this one was reproducing our, our experiment with a, a slightly different uh, method of, of producing the summary statistic. But this was a funny uh, coincidence. Well, funny for me, right? Uh, well, this is not very funny, so let's skip. Uh, now, this is a principle, but of course, a, this is only a principle. And there are many ways of, of implementing the method. And, and some will fail, and, and, and some will work, in the sense that will, they will produce a reasonable inference. And so from those uh, early papers in, in the 90s, primarily uh, population geneticists, and then progressively uh, statisticians from, from other communities came to, to try to analyze uh, uh, more thoroughly the properties of, of different ABC. Uh, solutions. One direction was uh, to try to improve the computational, computational efficiency of ABC by uh, proposing uh, not from the prior but from, from other, uh, other sources. So doing a kind of important sampling or MCMC or sequential MCMC or, or sequential Monte Carlo version of uh, the original ABC. And so there is a huge literature uh, on that throughout the, the, the year 2000, uh, that, that try to, to get closer to the, to the target, to, to one target, which is the ABC target, uh, by, by making better proposals. But in parallel, there is another direction uh, that gets away from computational uh, statistics to, to link ABC to statistical inference. And so the idea is to reinterpret, reinter and we'll see that in, in, in a slide too, to reinterpret ABC as a, a non-parametric estimation method. And so uh, to see this indicator that the pseudo-data and the data are close enough as a, a form of kernel, and to extend that to other possible kernels, rather than using just uh, the indicator, and therefore to translate this uh, parameter epsilon into a form of bandwidth of this kernel that can be estimated from the data, even though we don't know uh, the, the, the likelihood itself. And so there is a line of work in uh, at the same time period that, that tries to, to make this link. First, it I mean, it's interesting for, for several reasons. The first one is that it, it, it creates uh, a different validation for ABC. That's not just an approximation tool that we can program because we don't know to do anything else. That's a, a reasonable thing from a, a purely statistical perspective because we do try to approximate the, the likelihood function. And, and this approximation is converging under some assumptions and therefore, the resulting inference is a form of non-parametric Bayesian inference with a form uh, of validity, uh, again, under some, some assumptions. Okay. And then a uh, 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 last track uh, I mentioned on that slide is, is the one by uh, Oli Rettman and his courses, where epsilon itself becomes an object of interest. And although the paper didn't get uh, many followers, I, I find the, the perspective quite uh, interesting and worth pursuing, namely that epsilon could be another uh, parameter in the Bayesian inference. And the, the question uh, is then how to interpret, uh, how to interpret epsilon as, as an error, acceptable error on, on the observations. How far can we go uh, away from the data and still produce uh, interesting inference? And so this was a fully Bayesian uh, construction of ABC that, again, made sense, even though uh, there is not many papers in, in, this, in this direction. 
So, I mean, I, I won't talk too much about uh, purely computational uh, advances. And we see that in, in, in section O2. But first, let me mention some, some connection with, uh, with non-parametrics. Uh, starting with this, this paper by Marc Beaumont and, and, and co-authors, where they post-processed the ABC outcome, so the theta that were accepted on the first stage were uh, larger by pushing those far away closer to uh, the true uh, theta. Namely, they, they run a, a regression, uh, a local regression of theta on the summary statistic using uh, kernels uh, as weights. And for each observation, uh, theta z, they pushed theta back to theta star through uh, the, the coefficient uh, produced by this regression. And so this made uh, for the acceptance of, of more simulations and therefore for more stable uh, approximation to the posterior. Okay. And you can interpret that uh, directly as uh, a non-parametric regression uh, approach that, for instance, you, you find that in, in Fallon and Frangle. Uh, obviously, there, there is a difficulty in using first this, this local linear regression, even with, uh, with uh, non-parametric weights, and in, in believing that uh, those weights can uh, produce good approximation if the dimension is large. And so this curse of dimensionality uh, is, is ever uh, present in the ABC uh, perspective because uh, the approximation gets, is quite poor as the dimension grows. And therefore, that's another issue with picking the summary statistic, namely that uh, we have to, to try to get the dimension as, as low as possible. Okay, and skip that. But there, I mean, there are many references in the in the late nineties on on, on on this. Okay. Um, no, and let's skip that too. I want to mention the last one that is connected with uh, with non parametrics. Uh, that is more recent, and that makes again a bit more sense than the the, the earlier versions. Namely that when ABC is implemented, there is a, a given computer budget, so a certain number of simulations from the prior. Maybe this is sequential, but at a given time, a given number of simulations from the prior, those simulations from the prior are associated with simulations of, of pseudo data. And then the usual practice, an overwhelming practice, is to extract from this uh, simulation from the prior, those simulations that produce pseudo-observations that are as close as possible to the data. And so the epsilon, I mean, to make it clear, the epsilon is a quantile on the entire collection of simulated distances. So if we have a 10 million simulations, uh, we'll take 0.01% uh, of uh, those distances, and this will be the epsilon. So in the end, the output of an ABC algorithm is more of a KNN output than a regular uh, non-parametric bandwidth estimation of the density. Because uh, that's the only way to, to get a reasonable number of, of acceptances and to get a sample of reasonable size uh, rather than fixing an epsilon in advance. And so you can interpret uh, ABC directly as uh, a KNN uh, algorithm. And this leads to uh, choices of the epsilon that are driven by the standard uh, k-nearest neighbor uh, literature, uh, namely that uh, if n is a total number of simulation, kn over log log n should go to infinity, and kn over n should go to zero. Okay. And if you use a kernel uh, instead of the, of the indicator for, for your acceptance, there is a second uh, quantity that is hn, which is a, the bandwidth of this kernel for the acceptation. And uh, the, the rates for, uh, derived from this construction will depend on, on the dimension of, uh, of the model uh, in result of that form. So I mean, I don't want to go into any detail, but there is this recent reference by uh, Bio et al. 
that, that makes a very strong uh, validation of, of ABC in this script. There's a, there's a caveat, which is that this only applies when uh, the summary statistics are sufficient. So if the summary statistics are not sufficient, the, the, the paper uh, doesn't, doesn't cover that case. Okay. Um, let me move to uh, some more description of uh, the ABC implementation, but uh, also uh, the choice of the summary statistic. But I mean, the first, the first issue that I consider uh, of importance is what is this inference we are drawing with ABC? How Bayesian is, is it? Um, and there are several ways of attacking the, the, the question. Uh, the first one is, I mean, the minimum requirement is, is about the convergence of, of the method. So do we eventually produce estimations of the parameters of the parameters uh, that are uh, close to the truth. But that's uh, usually not sufficient for, uh, for validating the method as, as, a, as a Bayesian uh, answer. And the difficulty is to know how far we are from the true posterior. So the posterior of, of theta given the summary statistic. Of course, we could run a lot of simulations, but since we are in a complex uh, setting, uh, that's usually not uh, feasible. And, and so there is a, f a fatalistic uh, answer, which is that because we cannot do anything else, uh, we, we, we can deal with that. But actually, there, there is uh, a, a different uh, answer, which is that this is a true Bayesian uh, solution if we accept uh, some modification of the model or some modification of the data. And so uh, I, I will present one of the results in, in, in a few slides. Now, that's not uh, a completely satisfactory uh, answer. Uh, first, because the non-parametric side uh, is still very ad hoc, so it estimates the bandwidth or the tolerance on, on the one hand and then runs the Bayesian analysis on the other hand, so it's like plug-in estimation. And there is yet uh, progress to be made in, in incorporating the non-parametric validation within the, the Bayesian picture. And again, uh, Promoting the, the audio paper by uh, Oli Ratman and, and courses, I think this estimation of, of the approximation error and therefore of the tolerance should also be part of, 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 the, of the model itself. So we should have a, a all for one uh, model rather than little bits uh, glued together in, in a non Bayesian way. Okay, let me talk to you a little bit about uh, existing uh, implementation. So, again, simulating for the prior is uh, a terrible idea, is the likelihood is informative, uh, because we'll, we'll simulate a lot of points in regions that are of no interest for uh, the current data. And so very quickly, there were alternative proposals from uh, important sampling to ABC-MC-MC. So ABC-MC-MC uh, is, is a fairly straightforward extension where you run roughly the same uh, principle, simulating parameter, Simulating pseudo-data, looking if the pseudo-data is similar to the observed data, and accepting with uh, metropolis testing uh, ratio probability, where, as you may notice, there is no likelihood because x equal y is the first step to accept uh, this simulation. So there is hidden in this metropolis testing ratio, uh, there are two indicators, uh, one for the previous uh, pseudo-data and one for the current pseudo-data. And so this is valid and uh, just as easy to implement as uh, the original ABC. Okay, and the validation is, is, is very straightforward. Okay. Now, uh, so it's a bit in the wrong order, but uh, let me talk a bit about ABC mu, this, this idea of, of Ratman uh, et al. In, in, in a bit more detail. Ratman and, uh, and, and Colossus introduced the epsilon as part of the posterior, and so made this object a, a true Bayesian posterior in, in the space of uh, the augmented theta uh, epsilon. So the tolerance is, is no parameter to be determined. Okay. Now, of course, there are quantities here that are not uh, well uh, known, 
One is the prior on the distribution of the epsilon. The second one is this likelihood on, on epsilon and y that is uh, estimated in, in a non-parametric way. Okay. And so again, there is this problem that we are hitting uh, the curse of dimensionality, and we are using a plugging estimate in the picture. But pi of epsilon is, uh, is a prior determined uh, by the, the tolerance we want, we want to accept. Okay. And another innovation in this paper is, rather than pushing everything into a single distance, to use multidimensional distances to look at different aspects of, uh, of the problem. And so there are several distances, uh, one, say, for each summary statistic. And actually, they don't use real distances. They use differences. So what we call distances can be negative, which is uh, not a correct uh, version of a distance. But in, in that case, uh, zero is a possible value and more central value than uh, an extreme value of, of the possible distances. And this leads to, to this kind of, uh, of pictures on the distances. That, that is a much more exploratory, but richer way of, of running ABC. Uh, namely that you, you look, so this is a comparison of two models, but you look at the position of zero, which is a, the optimal distance, uh, in the distribution of the distances uh, on each of the models. And the exploitation of this uh, type of graph, that, that is produced by a regular ABC algorithm, is to look for inconsistency. And the graph on, uh, on the right has one of the distances that correspond to this uh, PAPR uh, summary statistic doesn't cover zero. So that means that the second model has some features that are not uh, really compatible with, with the current data. And so that's much more uh, explicit than in uh, in, in, in other approaches where you compute a possible probability of a model, here you're looking at, at a lot of small features, one dimension each, uh, you can pinpoint uh, directions where one of the models is not uh, doing okay uh, against uh, your data. Okay, uh, so let's skip there. Now, Another uh, version of, um, of implementing ABC is to try to learn about the target. So Mont in Makashe and Monte Carlo has its philosophy uh, in that direction in that we just move towards values of seeders that are closer to the target rather than simulating for the prior. Uh, we had a, a version that was more sequential Monte Carlo uh, where we constructed a sequence of uh, proposal, again, based on, on, on kernels, but in the parameter space, that got closer and closer to the target in the sequential Monte Carlo ID and didn't require, uh, of course, the, the use of, of important sampling, which was in, inspired by uh, an earlier paper by Scott Sisson and Causes that had this PRC ABC uh, ID, but with, with a bias in, in, in uh, the outcome. So I'll skip the, this detail. But the idea is just, is just to use sequential Monte Carlo that presumably you all know about, uh, producing a sequence of, of, uh, of, of particle uh, that move according to, to this moving target. And so this started outside ABC with these uh, validations by Del Moral, uh, uh, Doucet, and Jasra. But so let's skip that. They, they found an ABC uh, version that relates to, to our approach as well. Um, let's keep that as well. To uh, point another uh, answer to, to the previous uh, questions that was exposed by, by Richard uh, a, a few years ago, namely that from some perspective, ABC uh, is not approximative. It's exact if, even with a fixed tolerance, you accept to consider that your target is not the one based on the, the true data, but on the convolution around the true data. So the two last, the last two terms in the ratio, if you integrate out z, makes a replacement of the true likelihood that you cannot uh, compute with a, a convolution around the true likelihood. Okay. And so in, in that respect, uh, 
that's that's a, a, a true Bayesian approach. Now, what Richard pointed out is that if you replace the data with a, a noisy version of these data, uh, and if the noise is driven by the acceptance probability, uh, once again, you have uh, an exact uh, ABC, uh, Bayesian uh, solution. Assuming uh, this, uh, this modification of the data. But that's, that's just a new representation of, of the same thing. So that's to quote Richard. Um, and that's a fairly interesting approach in that it links to a lot of, of things. And I mean, I didn't mention indirect inference, but of course it also relates to indirect inference in that we are using the wrong model, but uh, doing proper inference on, on this wrong model. But there's also the link with uh, the model approximation theory of uh, Tony O'Hagan and, and, and courses. Now, there's a, another version uh, that says essentially the same, and I forgot uh, a sub subscript here. Uh, it's that uh, if from the start you modify your data with a noise that is a tolerance, uh, you do get an output that is uh, exact given this noisy version of the data. Okay. So uh, the idea is, is just that once the, the tolerance is fixed uh, or chosen or simulated, you replace your data with this noisy version, and then ABC is exact in, in, in this Bayesian sense. And you can prove a lot of conversion theorem uh, as, as shown, for instance, this, in these two papers. I mean, it's consistent, more consistent than uh, the non-noisy uh, ABC. With this step in, uh, that I find very important, the, at least the definition of, of the issues surrounding the choice of summary statistics and the proposal by uh, Fadden and Prangle uh, that got published in 2012 of what they call the semi-automatic uh, ABC. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's of course linked with, with things from the past, especially the, the idea of a noisy ABC. But uh, what, what they prove in, in this paper is a form of optimality of the, the posterior expectation as uh, the best choice of summary statistic. Okay, so, if you're interested in CETA, some of the best you can do using a, a loss function of, of these four is to take uh, the expectation of CETA given Y as your summary statistic. Of course, that's one of these optimality results that are not uh, directly useful, as in, uh, for instance, important sampling, the best importance function is something you can never use. Here, you cannot use this summary statistic because from the start, uh, this was a goal of, of the analysis. But from there, they, uh, they derive a, a practical uh, version where iterative approximation to these expectations are used. Okay. So, I mean, before moving to the, to the details uh, for a few minutes, I want to stop to, to point out that, for me, the most important result is that the optimal solution in that weak sense is of the dimension of theta. And so whatever the dimension of y, we should aim at a solution that is of the dimension of theta uh, to, to produce as, as fast as possible an approximation to some uh, posterior distribution. And this has impacted the, the following uh, works on, on ABC. OK, so some of the details are they use a non-parametric uh, version of ABC where instead of using an indicator, there's a kernel that decides on the approximation. So there is a related uh, bandwidth uh, H. They also uh, get away from, from prior simulation by using an, a, a proposal G. So they have an additional, an additional weight, importance weight to, the, to their method. And then they break uh, the the error into, into three steps. Uh, one that is not considered, that is the loss of information from, for going from the true posterior to the posterior given the summary statistic. One uh, where there is ABC 
uh, approximation, and the third one where you have uh, Monte Carlo uh, error. And fr from there, uh, they derive a sort of optimal choice of the bandwidth that, uh, somewhere later, but unsurprisingly, uh, you do get uh, the, the optimality in terms of non-parametric uh, speed of convergence. With, uh, again, some solution that is formal and not uh, so useful, but the optimal choice of impulse function is, is based on the root of uh, the, the likelihood based on summary statistic. Okay, let's keep that too, if we want to keep moving. Uh, but so what it proves is with this version of ABC that there is convergence as, as H uh, goes to zero, you can ignore the, the comments, uh, that in the noisy version, there is consistency as uh, the number of iterations go, uh, goes to zero. And then the, main, the central result is that the minimal error is produced, again, unsurprisingly, by the posterior expectation. And there is convergence of the ABC approximation to this solution. The choice of a bandwidth, as I said earlier, is uh, a standard non-parametric uh, speed. Uh, but with different solutions, if you are in the noisy or in the non-noisy uh, solution. And so in practice, because E of theta given Y is not available, uh, the semi-automatic uh, ABC runs a pilot run ABC based on a certain collection of summary statistics from there, produce a first approximation to the expectation of theta given y, and use this approximation as a new summary statistic to run a second ABC. And this produces uh, uh, much improvement in uh, the quality of uh, the, the ABC uh, distribution. Okay. All right, so this, this is one uh, side of the story. And the second part of the talk, we'll concentrate on, on another side which is model choice. So what we've seen so far is that I mean, there is a problem in conducting inference in, with complex likelihoods that are not available. ABC is one way of, of doing so with a lot of, of calibration uh, to be done, but uh, possibly uh, some uh, automatic versions are on the way. However, in, in practice, uh, or at least in, in population genetic practice, ABC is mostly used for model choice rather than parameter estimation. And so they have, as in the beetle example, there are around a dozen models or a few dozen models uh, to be compared based on, on some data. They are all uh, complex enough to require the use of ABC. And then the question is, can we run ABC to compare those models? And from the start, it, ABC was used that way. And what I will show you in the first part is that there are pros and cons to, uh, to this. And then hopefully in the second part, uh, show you how it, the summary statistic could be uh, used to this, uh, to this goal, towards this goal. Okay. So I want to remind you that uh, and Bayesian model choice uh, is implemented by putting a prior at the model index level uh, on top of priors on, on each of the parameters uh, for, for the different models. And given this uh, extra layer of uh, prior modeling, we try to produce uh, a posterior probability for each of the model indexes, uh, indices to, uh, for instance, get to the most uh, probable uh, model. Once uh, we see this uh, perspective on model choice, uh, ABC can be extended to this setting, namely that in, on top of simulating the parameters from the prior, we can simulate the model indices from the prior as well. And so an ABC model choice uh, algorithm has this extra line where at each proposal, we first simulate the model index then given the model index, we simulate the parameter from the corresponding prior. And then given model index and 
uh, parameter we simulate to the data. That makes no difference uh, in, in the end. The, the outcome is a simulation fra, from the Poisson dis distribution of the pair m theta m given uh, y or roughly y in the ABC sense. Okay, so all we have to do to, to, to run this algorithm is just to produce for each of the models a certain collection of uh, parameters, assuming that the probabilities are all the same. We just simulate the same number of parameters for all of the models, pseudo data for all of those parameters, and only keep those that are close enough to the observed data. And of course, the frequency of survival for different models will differ, and that's, that leads to our approximation of the posterior probability. So we just count how many of the proposals were kept in uh, the final run. Of course, you could, you could ask, uh, and I could ask uh, different questions, like why should you use the same tolerances, uh, the same distance, the same summary statistic, but that, that's the way it is run, and there are reasons for that. You cannot compare models based on different uh, observations. There is a version that, again, is somehow non-parametric in smoothing out this row uh, frequency estimate uh, using a, a multivariate logistic uh, approximation that allows, once again, to extend a little bit uh, the tolerance further and to, to keep in more uh, simulations and to have, hopefully, more uh, stable estimates, even though that doesn't prove they are closer to what uh, the Bayesian uh, truth would be. Interestingly, at least for me, in the, in the population genetic literature, there is a, a long sequence of uh, back and forth papers uh, about the validity of using ABC. And it, it was mostly uh, run by uh, uh, Alan Templeton, who is promoting a different approach called, uh, um, I forgot what it's called. Um, Clades, yeah, nested clades. And he never gave up, so it, there's a, a very long uh, sequence of papers where he, he, he states that ABC uh, is incorrect, and then, of course, there is a, the same collection of papers that, that states the opposite. I won't talk about that anymore. Now, what I want to talk about is, is whether ABC model choice is, is valid. So let's start with a very specific example so specific that it is almost a counterexample. And let's take uh, the, the, the case of, of, of Markov Random Field. Uh, and just in particular, the, the POTS model, where we try to compare different uh, Gibbs Random Fields for the same data. So we're trying to assess which model is the most uh, adequate for, for the data. So this is an example. Uh, of, of a POTS model, which is uh, parameterized by a single parameter conditional on a neighborhood structure. And let's assume that we want to uh, compare different neighborhood structures, which is like uh, comparing different graphs on, on the data. Okay. So uh, once again, we, we follow a Bayesian approach. Uh, we compute either possible probability or uh, the base factor. And if we have two different uh, neighborhood structures, uh, we will have to compute something that is uh, this ratio of integrals. Okay. So uh, that's, that's the ID. And for each of uh, the neighborhood relations, we therefore have uh, a different uh, summary statistic that is sufficient, uh, namely SM, which is a sum of neighbors with the same uh, color. And of course, if you change the neighborhood structure, you will change the value of SM. Okay, so uh, because uh, we are running ABC, we will only use uh, the SMs rather than the, the raw data to, to produce a comparison. Now, there is something very interesting with, with those Markov random field models, and that's very uh, special to them, namely that the summary statistic made of the collection of all summary statistics so S0, S1, Sm minus 1, remains sufficient not only for each of the models. Of course, you expand the vector, so it is still sufficient. But is sufficient across models. 
That means that if you condition on this vector of S0, S1, Sm minus 1, the possibility that m is equal to m is the same as if you condition on the entire uh, data set x. So that's the meaning of, of, of sufficiency for model comparison. And that, that's a rare occurrence. In, in most uh, situations, if you take some, uh, sufficient statistics for models, they don't remain sufficient across models. So in that case, if we run uh, ABC based on S of X, we are not losing any information. So that, that's a central part where we could run uh, a very precise ABC. Uh, actually, in some example, it was exact uh, because of the sufficiency of this collection of the number of neighbors. Okay, uh, and this is a special case. In most situations, we are facing uh, this, this case where you, if you have a sufficient statistic for model one, eta one, a sufficient statistic for model two, eta two, the pair eta one, eta two is not sufficient across model. So it's not sufficient for estimating m. It is sufficient, of course, for estimating theta m if you are given m, but not for the pair. And that leads to uh, a, a questioning of on the validity or of the validity of uh, ABC model choice. So let me show you an, an example uh, that uh, makes uh, immediate sense. Let's consider a comparison of a Poisson and of a geometric distribution for a given data set X1, Xn. In both cases, the sum of the observations is sufficient. Okay, so the collection of the sufficient statistics is, is S of X. Okay. If we condition only on S to make the decision, it's like trying to decide whether it's Poisson or geometric when S is equal to 27. Okay. We don't have any information contained in this S. So S brings information about lambda or P, but doesn't bring information about which model is the most appropriate. So we are losing uh, information. And in that case, we are losing the entire information about which model is correct by using this summary statistic. Okay. So I mean, once you've seen that, I mean, all the, the pictures are, are useless. It's just obvious that we cannot use S to make our, our model choice. Okay. In this example, there are, of course, ways to get around and create more statistics so that you get a sufficient statistic for model choice. But that's, that's a true example. In general cases, if you start with statistics that are not even sufficient, how much do you lose when you want to do uh, model choice? There is a danger of, of missing the entire information. Okay. And so the problem is, is what does ABC base factor uh, mean is it uh, at all uh, coherent? <coughs> I'm going to skip that. That's, that's an example. To, to give you the answer. So I mean, that, that's a paper we, we took a while to, to, to complete. But we wanted to answer this formal question that was uh, inspired by this ABC setting in a, a Bayesian framework. If you start from a statistic that is insufficient, how valid uh, is uh, the, the base factor? And in particular, is the base factor consistent if you condition only on t of y, which would be eta of y, rather than the entire uh, data set? Because in, in that case, it's, in most of the cases, it is consistent. Another example uh, makes uh, the case for precisely picking the right type of summary statistic. Uh, I'm comparing the, a normal, so it's a toy problem, I'm comparing a, a normal with unknown mean to a, no, to a Laplace with unknown mean. And I have the same uh, data set that comes from either M1 or M2. And I rescale the Laplace to get the same variance uh, in both cases, uh, namely one. And these are two graphs of the post distribution of the posterior probabilities when the data is normal and when the data is Laplace. On the left graph, you can see that posterior probabilities 
live in, in approximately the same region. So there is no discrimination between the two populations through the posterior probabilities. In the second case, the posterior probability is close to one when the data is normal, but it's close to zero when the data is Laplace. And therefore, the posterior probability is uh, discriminative. And I realize I skipped the slide, but uh, in what, what is the difference? Well, in the first case, I used three summary statistics, the empirical mean, the empirical median, the empirical variance to construct ABC. So the first, the two first, the first two um, summary statistics are informative about the parameters. The last one is ancillary, but could inform about the model. In the second graph, my summary statistic is uh, the median deviation from the median, the median absolute deviation from the median, the mad statistic. So I'm coming the median of y minus the median in absolute value, and only that one. Choosing the second summary statistic as the impact of making the base factor or the positive probability coherent and con convergent, which is not the case for the first one. And so I don't want to go into the math, but there are ways of formalizing the, the problem so that we can identify which summary statistics are OK and which summary statistics are not. Okay. So there is a, a, a couple of assumptions that are essentially variations around the central limit theorem of the kind you find in, uh, in Bayesian asymptotics. So we have to make assumptions on the prior as well to cover the right value of the parameter. And there is a, in, the, in those assumptions, there is a quantity that appears mu naught, which is the asymptotic mean of the summary statistic, and mu of theta, which is the asymptotic mean of the summary statistic under one of the two models. And this is central to, to the result that I will, I will describe briefly. Uh, if this mu naught is covered by the collection of the mu of theta, so if the true mean of the summary statistic is covered by the model, that's a weak form of saying the model is correct, the marginal likelihood that appears in the of probability is well behaved. It is uh, equivalent to a constant. If, on the opposite, the mean of the summary statistic under model i doesn't cover the true mean, which is a weak way of saying that the model is not correct, then the marginal goes down to zero as the sample size grows. Again, with, with some assumption. Okay. And so the conclusion about uh, this uh, mathematical study is that the choice of the summary statistic is, is very simple in that all that matters is whether or not the model covers the asymptotic mean of the summary statistic. In other words, if you are covering models, the summary statistic must be such that one and only one of the two models uh, covers the, the, the mean of the summary statistic. So the summary statistics must differ in terms of, of mean behavior under both models. And what happened in my previous example was that because I had forced the variance to be the same under both models, the estimator of the mean was converging to the same value for both models, but also the estimator of the variance was converging to the same value for both models. And that's why it couldn't work to discriminate between the two models. On the opposite, the MAD statistic had a different behavior under the normal and the Laplace model. And so this leads to a way to to check for the choice of summary statistics, namely to see whether the means are different <coughs> under both models. And, and that's a practical procedure that we can implement quickly given uh, the ABC output, uh, checking uh, by a regular test uh, whether the, the means are, are identical. Okay. And so if you apply this test uh, in the Laplace versus Gauss example, if I use a math statistic, the uh, distances in the, in the chi-square uh, scale are very far away from uh, the acceptance bound, while if I don't use the math statistic, they are under uh, the acceptance bound, and therefore the means are identical. So it's only a matter of means, and so picking the summary statistic uh, should be driven by a different behavior of the means under, under both models. And of course, increasing the dimension of the statistic 
as this uh, effect that uh, the larger the dimension, the most more likely uh, the, the means will be different. OK, this was a very quick uh, mention. But just to point out that despite uh, an intense use in, in, in the population genetic literature of ABC form of the choice, there are issues in the selection of the summary statistics that are really specific to, uh, to model choice. And of course, if you look back at the literature and the summary statistics they, they, they have been using, uh, they, they created summary statistics that really oppose one model uh, to all the others. And so naturally, in their construction, uh, this uh, constraint that the, the behavior should be different was integrated. And so some of it, I mean, the, there is a problem, but they, they went around the problem by creating the, the right summary statistic. OK, so just to conclude with, with the last uh, section, uh, this is like very recent work uh, that I want, I want to mention on choosing summary statistic uh, using a uh, random forest. So I couldn't find a forest in, uh, in, in Iceland, so I took a picture of a, of a forest somewhere else. Yeah. In a, yeah, it's, it's very random, yeah. One of the conferences I've been to. Uh, OK, so this induces another re-evaluation of, of what I'm doing and why I'm doing it, in that in my limited understanding of, of machine learning, uh, we are pushing uh, the solution towards a, a more machine learning-like uh, uh, interpretation. And one major step of, of this analysis when picking the, the summary statistic, is that uh, we are so far abandoning the ID, giving up on the ID of estimating properly the posterior probabilities of the different model. So what we saw from this analysis was that uh, the approach was uh, very good at selecting the, the, the right model. But the associated estimation of the posterior probability uh, was uh, difficult to trust and very far away from uh, the, the true posture probability. And so instead, we propose to replace posture probabilities with uh, predictive uh, errors. So it's almost complete um, work. OK, so let me remind you very quickly about uh, random forest. Uh, random forest uh, are an extension of, uh, of, of, of bagging uh, making uh, algorithms uh, to uh, in induce uh, variability uh, towards uh, better performances. Okay, so it's a forest. Of, the forest is just made of trees, and each of the trees is a decision tree about uh, classification in uh, different categories. Okay. And the randomness, uh, at least in the original solution, uh, comes from uh, two levels. The first one is uh, not using uh, the original data, but a bootstrap version of uh, the set. And in constructing the tree, not using the entire collection of uh, the characteristics of the data, but a subset uh, that is randomly picked for each node in, in the, in the uh, allocation and classification tree. Okay. So the, the tree is made of, of decision steps uh, that at each node you go left or right depending on the value of a certain uh, classification variable x tau, tau being chosen uh, according to the best uh, discriminating power. And here uh, we use a Gini uh, index of uh, the probability of being in one uh, population or, or, or in others. And so, I mean, there is nothing new there. This is just a reminder of uh, the random forest uh, uh, algorithm where for a certain number of trees, that we picked by uh, following the, the 500 uh, solution in the original algorithm. Uh, you construct uh, a, a tree by uh, following uh, uh, branches to until uh, there is a single uh, category uh, in, in the end uh, leaf of each of those trees. And so that, that's used to, to make a, a, a prediction of the uh, category of, of, a, of a new data set, and we will use it for our data set in ABC uh, model choice. Okay, so 
for each of the trees, you have to follow a certain path according to the value of, of each of those x tau's, given that the bounds are, are determined, and you end up in one of the classes. And at the end of the day, you have a frequency of, uh, of belonging to each of, of the classes. And the most frequent one uh, would tell you that you should pick this as, as your predictive uh, class. So in the case of model comparison, that will be the most uh, probable model inspired by uh, the random forest. Okay. Now, there is something that, that we discussed. This is something we discussed with uh, Gerard Bio, that is with, with uh, a colleague in Paris 6, uh, who worked on, uh, on, 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 on those topics. And he advised us to pick, uh, rather than the original uh, sample, a subsample that relates to Michael's talk of, of yesterday. Uh, we built our random uh, forest trees by s taking a bootstrap subsample of the original sample, uh, both for uh, performance reasons that led to much uh, better uh, model choice, but also because uh, in practice we had large data sets, and so uh, using a, s a small data set was uh, a much better solution, a more efficient solution. And there is no culling in the branches, which means that uh, we stop when there is a, a category for each uh, of, of, of the leaves. Okay. And again, this is very st standard, so I apologize if this, if this took too long, but uh, we simply run uh, off the shelf uh, uh, algorithm like, like the R random forest to to, to check uh, this idea. There is nothing new at this level except for the, for the subsampling. Okay. Now, that produces an outcome, namely that starting from the ABC reference table from, from this large collection of simulations, we build, a, we, build a, uh, we build a random forest, and this procedure is applied to the observed data, and that leads to a solution that is a replacement of the true map solution. Okay. So that's a number, that's an index, and that could be uh, the, the end of the day. Uh, now, of course, the tree is something much more complex that, than just a number. And, and as I showed in this little uh, gra uh, graphic, there is a, there's a location to each of the models with a certain frequency. And so it's very tempting to move further and to relate this frequency of allocations to the different models to uh, the possible probability of each of the models. Of course, acknowledging that there are several levels of approximation, and that's not exactly the same thing, but maybe with enough power and so on, uh, we would be close to the possible probability. Okay. Now, in experimenting with this idea, we, we found that it's actually not a great idea because uh, it's, it's highly viable, for one, first. And second, uh, it's very, very little related with, with the true possible probabilities. And so I'll show you a, an example, an example in, a, in a minute. But we decided instead of trying to push uh, the exploitation of the random forest to this level, to give up on uh, producing the approximation of the personal probability, and rather moving to uh, an error evaluation through the same uh, ABC outcome. Namely that given this procedure, I pick the model uh, M using the procedure M hat of X, what is the probability of picking the wrong model? And this is an immediate outcome of uh, the, the ABC simulation. Once we have the, the random forest, uh, we just have another round of, of, of simulation very quickly, and, and this produces uh, a, a number. And, and the important thing is that this is a possible probability, a possible error, in the sense that the, the pairs theta and m are produced conditionally on the data. And so it's, it's, a, it's a posterior predictive uh, error in, in the Bayesian sense. And so in, in that sense, it's, it's a true Bayesian estimate, but of uh, different quantities and the posterior probability. It's conditional on, on, the, on the data, modulo the ABC uh, approximation error uh, as, as usual. Okay. And, and in terms of, of implementation, that's 
uh, very quick because we already have uh, the ABC table. We just have to re-simulate a uh, new pseudo-sample to make them independent from those co used to construct uh, the random forest. Okay. So let's get back to this uh, old uh, toy uh, example of uh, comparing MA1 or MA2. So I have data. I want to, to compare the two models. And in this uh, older paper, we use the, the first uh, two autocorrelations. So what this is a simple enough model so that we can compute exactly the posterior probability that it is MA2 versus MA1. By doing numerical integration, uh, that's uh, easily uh, implemented. Okay. And this is the outcome of the comparison of uh, what the exact posterior probability that the model is 2 on the first axis and the posterior probability that uh, the model is 2 using ABC and the random forest. If in an ideal world, uh, you should see uh, a diagonal straight line, right? If the two things were, were strongly connected. In, in this experiment, you can see that um, even though there is a lot of concentration on the two extremes, 0 and 1, the rest of, of the graph shows a, a lack of, of connection between the two quantities. So the posterior probability uh, produced that way using only S of X um, and the random forest is, is not informative about the true possible probability. And of course, you can have uh, different decisions based on one and, and the other. Okay. Now, there's something I didn't talk about, but we could, to select the summary statistic uh, in the estimation uh, or in, in, in the classification sense, we could also use a uh, other tools, like uh, linear discriminant analysis. But in <coughs> those cases, for instance, again, MA1 versus MA2, uh, LDA doesn't, doesn't work well because uh, the two uh, statistics, you can recognize the, the triangle more or less, are uh, over, over, I mean, they are overlapping one another. And so uh, finding a linear discrimination doesn't, doesn't work well in that case. And so, of course, uh, if we try to apply different uh, discriminant uh, methods in, in that case, uh, we do get a range of, 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 uh, of performances. The one based on the whole data using uh, exact posterior probabilities, once again, it's feasible because it's a problem, so we can run numerical integration, leads to an error rate of, of 12%. So this is the bottom line. Because of the previous picture, uh, LDA doesn't work well, so that's one of the top uh, error rates of 27%. And then after the range of uh, those solutions are around uh, 16 or, or 17%, uh, the optimal one is, uh, is using uh, uh, KNN with a certain number, uh, well, with, with a number, certain number of neighbors. But you can see that run for us does about uh, as well with a 17% uh, error rate without any uh, input. Now, if we move to, to, to conclude, we'll move to a few uh, uh, genetic uh, examples that are, uh, again, uh, relevant uh, in, in the population genetic world. So those are uh, three possible scenarios for explaining uh, the divergen divergence uh, between uh, three populations. Uh, population 2 could have first diverged from population 1 and then later in time fr from population 0, or the reverse. Or population 0 and population 1 could have uh, recombined uh, at a more recent time to produce uh, population 1. Okay. So that's uh, something that we could consider in a real case. And I have two examples. One is based on, on SNPs, and another one is, is based on only uh, micro satellites. And of course, SNPs are more informative than, than the other one. Yeah, I didn't mention that, but this, uh, this graph and the analysis is based on um, a certain uh, software that uh, the, the team of uh, biologists in, in Montpellier developed called DIY ABC, that is an ABC software only intended for 
this type of, uh, of population genetic problem. So this is an input uh, of, uh, of the software where one defines different scenarios. And for each of these scenarios, uh, some summary statistics are automatically proposed. And so that's I mean, one specific feature of the, those population genetic um, settings, namely that the biologists have developed uh, along the years uh, a fairly exhaustive collection of summary statistics uh, that we can borrow from. And the nice thing about um, random forest, well, one nice thing about random forest is that we can start with a large collection of summary statistics. In the end, you, you, you have a single forest that is produced out of whatever number of summary statistics you, you started with. And so there's this, this automatic uh, construction of a, a summary statistic that is only intended for model comparison, but that can borrow strength from uh, a fairly large number of, of summary statistics. So here we have, we have 48 uh, summary statistics as produced by the outcome of, of DIY ABC. Uh, if I go a little bit in, into the, the details of this example, uh, there are six or seven parameters. Uh, the effective sample size are uh, reparameterization of the, the times of separation between populations. So there are, there are four of them. Uh, then uh, we put priors on, on all of those, uh, of those quantities. Uh, it's, of course, a, a a constraint on the diversion times. And the other models are about the same, except the third one, because there is an, uh, a recombination. So there's an extra probability of recombination, which is the admixture rate R. Okay, so in the worst case, there are only seven, uh, seven parameters. Okay. And so the, the summary statistics are comparing models inside each model, so this is called a single sample statistic, between two samples, these are two sample statistics, and the three samples, these are three sample statistics. So this makes a different uh, perspective on uh, the viability between the populations. And so the data set is, uh, is made of, uh, well, 25 bi-allelic individuals, which means that because there are two alleles, there are actually uh, 50 observations per, uh, per population. And for each of these individuals, we have 1,000 SNPs, which is a fairly uh, large uh, level of information about, about the difference. And the, the starting uh, reference is this 33% uh, of the, the naive base uh, classifier. Regular ABC, when I write ABC KNN, is a regular ABC, but selecting the tolerance uh, using this KNN rule as uh, error rates of either 25% or 22%. And if I uh, use either uh, LDA, I get down to 22%. And the nice thing is that if I incorporate LDA in this collection of summary statistics, I can, I can get down to, to 19%, which is the best uh, performance in, in, this, in this example. Okay. Um, one, one thing about this uh, error rate, this is a collection of uh, the summary statistic LDA1 and LDA2 for the three uh, populations produced from the ABC table. And so starting from, from this picture, uh, we looked at uh, the error rate by picking two uh, <coughs> hypothetical cases. Uh, green one and the red one. For each of those uh, cases, we re-simulated uh, pseudo-data, so those are the green and the red dots, and could produce, instead of, uh, of an average uh, error, which is a prior uh, error rate, conditional error rates that were 1% for the favorable case that, that, that is at the tip of uh, one of the populations, and a 14% or 10% sorry, error rate for the case that is uh, in between, which is uh, much more uh, interesting than, than a global uh, evaluation. Now, another uh, illustration is 
in a more complex case where we only use uh, micro satellites, so there are there is much less information about the genetic uh, viability among the population. The, the questions are the same. Uh, the sample statistics are uh, less uh, developed because, again, there is less uh, information. But this is a collection of them. And in that case, uh, the, the error rates are higher because, once again, there is much less uh, information uh, in, in the data. Uh, LDA um, then gets uh, a bit better than, than previously. Uh, the naive base is, again, the worst. And uh, once again, the solution that includes the LDA into the picture produces a, the lowest uh, prior error rate. And we can repeat the same uh, game by, you can see that there is much more overlap between the population. But if we pick an extreme one or a central one, uh, we do get posterior error rates that are 18% uh, in the first case and 43% in the second case, which is above uh, the prior evaluation, but that's conditional on, on when we are again. And just to conclude uh, with, with the Beatles, uh, as I said, the, the picture I, I produced was one of the possible scenarios. There are actually 10 scenarios. And so this graph is try, to try to represent in dimension two uh, the overlap between the 10 possible scenarios through the summary statistics uh, LDA1 and uh, LDA2 uh, that are derived from the, the summary statistics. And you can see there is a lot of, of overlap uh, between, between those 10 scenarios. And so if we use uh, the different methods, uh, well, maybe unsurprisingly, but once, once again, in this complex uh, setting, we do get uh, the best performances with uh, the random forest. But the number of 35% is, is not so exciting because uh, it, it is sort of unrelated with this original conclusion of ABC saying that uh, the model chosen has a 91% uh, posterior probability. There is much, uh, much larger error. And uh, if we apply our posterior predictive uh, error evaluation, we still uh, keep at, uh, at a high value of uh, of of thirty seven percent so that kind of relative eye, uh, that put more relativity in the choice of the scenario uh, we eventually picked so that's a partly a negative conclusion but uh, we really feel we don't uh, trust uh, at all the posterior probability evaluation there are, there are other ways you can use uh, random forest, in particular to pick uh, summary statistic, because there is a kind of cutoff phenomenon uh, that uh, appears in the selection of the different summary statistics. Uh, for instance, the, I don't know if you can see, but the first uh, three most important summary statistics are the LDAs, for instance. And then after there is a cutoff where the others are not so important. OK, just uh, a final word about this, this method. Uh, The first thing is that in model choice, it's, it's hard to determine which summary statistics are the, the proper ones. So if I, I mentioned this way of checking for the mean, but if you have a large collection of, of summary statistics that are available, you cannot go and test for all the means being equal or different. The second thing is that it's, it's important to try to aim for a small dimensional summary statistics when leading model choice. And so LDA is, is one good example. If you have M models, you have exactly M minus one summary statistic. That's the best you can do in, in that respect. And in that sense, uh, random forests are, are uh, this automatic prediction of a summary statistic uh, for model choice. And the evaluation we've made so far uh, just produced uh, satisfactory uh, output. This is not the end of the story because uh, what we had in mind at the beginning of this of this study was to use also random forest for model estimation, and this this would have been like the the grail of or the grail of uh, of the research for summary statistics in that it would have produced a summary statistic for model choice, another summary statistic for parameter estimation, and unfortunately. This, this doesn't work well 
or as well in, in parameter estimation, which is a much more complex situation. You are trying to produce a function rather than just uh, a, a classification device. Uh, and so there is still an, an open problem on, on selecting uh, summary statistic for uh, parameter estimation. But uh, nonetheless, that's not uh, a completely negative uh, conclusion uh, in that if any tool uh, that can translate into a summary statistic can be turned inside uh, this method, that's, that's the first thing. We can give, uh, I think, more accurate evaluations of uh, the properties of, of this tool through the predictive error and, and put relativity on, on the, the published uh, posterior probabilities. This is uh, generic enough to be included in the, in the software DIY ABC. And we are looking uh, towards uh, new approaches to still recover uh, uh, this more Bayesian uh, analysis of, of the posterior probability. And so I hope that, that through this, this, uh, this slides, I gave you a, a generic enough tour of, of ABC. The end was, was more connected with my uh, recent work, but I, I thought it was important because of, of the new message. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a really active work, the uh, field of work. That, as I said, you can find papers uh, appearing on, on archive almost every day uh, on, on, on this topic. And there is a need uh, for uh, improved uh, solutions because, again, the, the, at least the field of population genetics has no uh, alternative uh, solution to, to analyze their, um, their data. So I'm... I mean, if you, if you want to get in, uh, into it, there's, there's plenty to do uh, and, and plenty of people to talk with uh, in, in different fields because they, they do uh, need uh, this kind of tool. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? And this, this last part is, is based on, on random forest and random forest don't have so far a very, a very strong uh, theoretical justification. So to make the link of with validation in terms of model choice and how good it, it is an approximation to M MAP is, is one of the open questions, for instance. Uh, the, the other question that is less theoretical but more methodological is to try to find uh, projection methods that, that are better than, uh, than LGA or others to to summarize um, automatically uh, a, a large collection of, of summary statistics. So far, I I've not seen anything that, that is really uh, uh, convincing of going from the raw data into, into a, a projection. We have to go through this level of, of summarizing into a large family of, of summary statistics. But I think looking for projection methods and different uh, types of metrics that, that would bring things to a more condensed and, and lower dimensional uh, solution is, is uh, one of the directions of interest. Okay, I have a question about choosing of summary statistics. So can I use some, if I use some external knowledge on summary statistics, for example, I'm working in biology, and biologists told me that this is what, what qualities of data I'm interested in, and. This is the threshold of variability in the data I'm interested in. Um, if I apply this summary statistic like for this biologically meaningful reason, is I'm safe? Well, you're never safe. That's that's a rule in life. But uh, what happens is that the biologists usually have, have I mean, or any any applied field or any field applying statistics, they have they have a, a fairly good understanding of their model. And so what happened in this, in this population genetic example was that there was a danger of getting, going astray, but actually by looking at the probabilities of the statistics they had chosen, uh, they didn't go astray. So the validation was there. Now, if, if you have a, a doubt about uh, the, the choice of summary statistic, the current evolution is just to bring more into the game and then to, s to let uh, an algorithm see through which ones are, are relevant or not. And so you just can add some. 
then then you're safer, uh, pro provided you you have a good projection method that that keeps the dimension uh, as low as possible. But it's, I say it's safer to start from this collection than from the raw data because usually if you start from the raw data, you end up with terrible uh, results for the reason that the tolerance gets very high. So it's it's I think it's always safer to to start from a reasonable collection, reasonably large collection of summary statistics. But I mean, there is much, a lot of work to be done in, in that direction, but, but still that, that um, that's my perspective on, on that. Yeah.